<coughs> so since there's this week and next week, um, on the down slide, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with some tips on witnessing to Mormons, <coughs> and then more specifically next week getting into actually tactics for, for witnessing. And the tactics you can actually use for Mormonism and for other cults, non-believers, and so forth. But today is more Mormonism. Now, some of it's going to be review. Uh, some of it's going to be uh, fresh material <coughs> for today. But in, I'm going to cover a lot of materials specifically today. So if you want to take notes as far as uh, verses that you can refer to later, you know, that'd be great. Um, I'm going to go through a Roman road to salvation as I apply it to Mormons. So it's a little bit different. Some of the verses you recognize, but still a little bit different than probably some you're used to. Yes? You can't hear you very well. Okay. Yeah, I used to pull the button, sorry. Okay. The All right. Let me turn this off. You hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yes? Uh, the, the first one a couple weeks ago was the Bible versus the Book of Mormon. And then the one last week was um, the Lost Book of Abraham. Both of them are actually on YouTube. So you can, you can go to YouTube and look. The quality is not quite as good because I brought uh, DVDs in. But you can, you can watch them. And actually you can see part of the end of the videos, which we didn't have time to show in 45 minutes. So, <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna to have to remember to stand here. I like to walk around, as you know, and so now I'm stuck here. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things is, is when you're getting ready to witness to Mormons, um, get to know them. Whether it's a Mormon friend, coworker, or if it's just missionaries that knock on your door, uh, you wanna to get to know them uh, as the saying goes, people don't care how much you know until you, they know how much you care. And that really holds true. I find that out as a chaplain every time I deploy. Uh, because a lot of times I'll just, before I get into my chaplaincy, I'll ask them, you know, hey, uh, do you need water? Are you hungry? Are you comfortable? You need... So I just let them know before we start into any conversation to make them comfortable. So it's, it's the same way with witnessing, to, no matter who you're witnessing to. So, we haven't accomplished anything if we win the argument, but we lose the soul. And, and the reason I say that is because oftentimes we are so concerned with, we're going to show those Mormons, you know, what Christianity is all about. And, but remember 1 Peter 3.15, where it says to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts, always being ready to what? To give a defense which is apologia, which is where we get the term apologetics in English. <clears throat> but the last part of it is what? In, in the King James Version, it's with meekness and fear, and in some of the other modern translations, it's with gentleness and respect. So that's what we want to concentrate on, is to get them to feel uh, at ease. I mean, how, how many of you ever walked door to door witnessing Christianity. You feel a little uneasy sometimes. So imagine how the Mormon missionaries are doing with, when they do this all the time. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and also keep in mind that Mormons are very sensitive to speaking with evangelical Christians. They feel like they've been attacked. Um, and because of that, they are oftentimes kind of on the defense that we want to actually break that barrier so that we can have a conversation with them that uh, they may not accept Christ right then, but at least uh, plant the seed. Remember what I said a few weeks ago is you want to be that pebble in their shoe <clears throat> so that as they walk, you know, they feel that ouch, ouch. And they're reminded of some of the words and some of the conversations that, we, that we've had with them. <clears throat> once, <clears throat> once everyone is comfortable, uh, they're comfortable, you're comfortable, um, 
ask them a few questions. You know. I, I learned a valuable lesson, and one of the first things I do if I have a missionary or missionaries come to my door, I ask them, how much time do you have this afternoon? And the reason I do that is because what I found out and the valuable lesson I learned is that if the conversation gets heated uh, or uncomfortable, they're going to make an excuse to call the ward, and guess what? Something came up, and they've got to leave. But if you ask them, how much time do you have? They will generally commit to that time, and they'll stay. Now, when they... <clears throat> A term you need to be familiar with is when they do start feeling uncomfortable or the conversation gets heated, they're going to come up with a term and they will say, I feel a spirit of contention coming on. And that means they're very uncomfortable uh, and pretty much the conversation is over. And I think if you remember, uh, I think at the beginning of the series, I said that some missionaries that came to our house when we were in Los Angeles, one of them said that, and I knew they were about ready to leave. So what did I do? Anybody remember? I told them, you know what? I apologize for you feeling the spirit of contention because I invited you into my home. And because I invited you into my home, you're a guest. So let's, let's pray that God will take away the spirit of contention. And so I prayed. You think they're going to leave after that? No. So they stayed for about another two hours after we prayed. And it's just a matter of getting them at ease. And as soon as, as soon as I prayed, they no longer felt that. Or if they did, they weren't going to admit it. And so we got down to some serious conversations. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the first things that Mormon missionaries, especially, are probably going to ask you to do is pray about the Book of Mormon to see whether or not it is true. That, that's one of their, their topics. My, my first instinct is to ask them, um, which version? The 1830? Uh, the 1981? Or one of the, ones, one of the ones in between? And see, they, they will, they will uh, quote James 1.5, and it says, any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally and unbrighteth not, and it shall be given to them. At this point, ask them to read aloud uh, a very familiar verse to us, which is Acts 17.11. And it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and what? Search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So Luke is stressing to, as believers that we search the scriptures daily. He doesn't say pray about it. He says what? Search the scriptures to see whether something is, is so. <clears throat> and if you notice, I said, ask them to read aloud. And the reason for that is I'd like to ask whether it's a Mormon a Jehovah's Witness, a non-believer, I like to ask them to read aloud because if you read a verse or a passage aloud, are they really listening to you? What they're usually doing is they're formulating their next thought, their next move. And so they're generally not listening. But if you have them read aloud, then that's what they have to do. And so, and so all it does is it allows you to stay in control of the conversation and to guide that conversation in the direction that you want it to go. <clears throat> so that's just one of the tips. Um, so when they ask you, you know, to pray about the Book of Mormon, first off, in order to pray about the Book of Mormon and see if it's true, you're presupposing that the Book of Mormon is true. Otherwise, why would you have to pray about it? <clears throat> and then ask the Mormon, are, are there circumstances where you wouldn't have to pray about something, whether it's true or not? <clears throat> if 
For example, I may ask a Mormon, it may sound strange, but I may ask them, do I have to pray about whether or not to commit adultery? Well, of course not. I mean, that's a silly question, but the point is, there are some things that you just don't need to pray about because you know they are either true or false. In our case, we know that the Book of Mormon, based on what we've learned so far in this class, has a lot of misgivings. It's been changed almost 4,000 times since 1830. <clears throat> and so there are just some things you don't need to pray about. And so that's the point that, that Luke makes in Acts, <clears throat> where he says, search the scriptures daily as those in Thessalonica. So um, we want, again, we want to stay in control of the conversation. And then once we get past the preliminaries, ask them, how much knowledge do you have about Mormonism? Um, how, how's your knowledge regarding the history of Mormonism? Are you aware of the changes that have occurred through the years since the inception of Church of Latter-day Saints? Yeah. <clears throat> and one of the things I like to do is I, I like to ask them, what, what do you like best about your religion? And then ask them, what do you like least about your religion? And then I'll follow it up with, what do you struggle with about your religion? Because what you'll find is that many Mormons have a lot of doubts about their religion, particularly if they are aware of all the, the changes and aware of some of the contradictions. Um, <clears throat> and so they just ask them, what do you like best? What do you like least? And what do you struggle with? And I guarantee you they're going to be struggling with something. It's almost a given. The thing that we have to do is be careful because statistics show that most people who leave Mormonism do not go to another religion. They become atheists or agnostics. And if you have a friend or an acquaintance who you were able to carry on a conversation with and eventually they leave the Mormon church. You have to keep in mind, once they leave the Mormon church, they've lost everything. They've lost family, they've lost friends. They're gonna be excommunicated. And so you better be ready to take up the slack <clears throat> and guide them through the steps until they're solid with Christianity. See, as Christians, we're really good at witnessing, but I think we fall short when it comes to following through. That's one thing that the Mormons have, is if you're in the Mormon church, um, you have a community, you have a family, and that's why so many people join the church. And you can, you can ask them, um, why are you a Mormon? Did, did you uh, become a convert? Were you raised in a Mormon family? And if somebody says, you know, they're a convert, uh, why did you convert, of all the religions, why did you convert to, to Mormonism? And I think I told you, my wife Alice has a friend who converted to Mormonism, and her excuse was because the Mormon church saved my marriage. I believe that. <clears throat> and my wife asked her friend if she would read some articles and material that I had written through the years on Mormonism, and she didn't want to do it. Because she knew that if she left Mormonism, she would lose friends, she would lose some of her business, she would lose everything. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, <clears throat> we talked. Yeah. Why even some parts of the story of Joseph Smith tell me making considering how much gold it was in those stories? Other than impossible for us to run with those that are 
Right. So <clears throat> you're saying that it doesn't make sense that Joseph Smith uh, would claim to have the, the golden plates because of the weight. Um, yeah, and that, that's been brought up a number of times. Um, but suppose, supposedly they are very thin plates, but if you look at the Book of Mormon, uh, even that much, they would be pretty heavy. Uh, but we don't know because Moroni took the gold plates, right? And so we don't have any manuscripts. Now, one thing that we talked about before is that <clears throat> they believe that the Bible is correct as far as it is uh, correctly translated, but they also believe that the Bible has been corrupted. Um, and regardless of what Joseph Smith and others in Mormonism have said about the Bible being corrupted, the Bible is actually very reliable. Uh, as a matter of fact, if, if you've gone through my introduction to apologetics class, you may remember that I spend an entire class on the reliability of the New Testament. It is extremely reliable. One of, the, one of the things you can do is mention to them how reliable it is regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> Remember, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the Qumran Caves in 1947. What was the most significant find of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Anybody know? What's that? How accurate, but specifically, they found an entire scroll of the book of Isaiah. And when they examined the book of Isaiah, it predated anything we had in existence in 1947 by a thousand years. And guess what? What we had in existence in 1947, when compared to the entire scroll they found in the Qumran caves, was extremely similar, about 4% difference and those four percents were scribal errors, misspellings, and so forth, but nothing that would alter or change the doctrine in Isaiah. Oh. So <clears throat> when I talk about that, that's when I want to bring up and ask them to to read Isaiah 4310, and it says this. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. And here it comes. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. <clears throat> it's pretty clear. <clears throat> and one of the things that, that sometimes I'll ask is when they talk about the Bible being corrupted is... Do you think Mormons would corrupt the Book of Mormon or any of their holy books? And what do you think they're going to say? Well, no. Okay, so the follow-up question is, then, then why would you think that Jews and Christians would corrupt their holy book if you admit that the Mormons wouldn't? It doesn't logically make any sense. Um, another verse I asked them to read is Isaiah 44, 6. And it says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. So from, from 44.6, you can just drop down a few, uh, few passages to um, Isaiah 44.8. And it asks, Are there any other gods? And it says, I know of not any. So one of the things I ask is, okay, the God of this planet, would he be aware and know that there are other gods for other planets? And what do you think they're going to say? Yeah. Okay, what about Isaiah 44, 8? I know not of any. And remember, having discovered the entire scroll of Isaiah in 1947 and how accurate it is, pretty much dispels uh, any assertion by Joseph Smith and others that uh, the Bible has been corrupted. So at this point, what you want to do is talk to them about differences in Mormon theology and Christian theology. Remember I mentioned before, Mormons believe they're Christian. 
they will tell you that they are a Christian. I mean, they use the same terms, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, salvation. Uh, and that's why it's really uh, easy for some Christians who are not aware of what Mormonism is to believe that they are actually Christian, but they're just another denomination. But it's also why a lot of Mormons believe that they too are Christian. So go through the differences of God the Father. According to them, what? Uh, there are many gods. Uh, their religion is what we call polytheism. Uh, many gods, more specifically, henotheism, which means they believe in many gods, but they only worship one of the many gods. And of course, Jesus Christ, who they believe is the spirit brother of Lucifer and was begotten in a natural sense, just like we are. And then go through the different denominations, I mean, go through the different doctrines and compare them and show them that um, Mormonism, in fact, is, is not Christianity. And please, don't, don't call them a cult. How many of you think they are a cult? Yeah, don't tell them that. Because as soon as you tell them that, you know, it's time to call the ward and oops, something came up. Okay. <clears throat> and I find sometimes when I talk to Mormons, it's really hard for me not to tell them they're a cult. But I bite my tongue and I just go through the steps to keep them calm so that we can have a viable conversation. See, the Mormon's goal is uh, to live a sinless life so that they can become God after they leave this earth. Uh, they believe that they can strive <clears throat> as much as is within their power to become sinless on this earth and then after that, God will give them grace. Well, then my thought is, well, then how much grace does God give you? And how much grace is enough? And they just, they, they don't realize that uh, God has already given us grace through Jesus Christ on the cross. They, they believe that through their works, that they can obtain exaltation in the next life. But although they, they realize that uh, they strive to be sinless, they also know that it's a struggle on a daily basis. Um, their organization says, okay, you're going to sin, but never repeat the same sin again. So if you commit a sin, pray about it, confess your sin, but never repeat that same sin again. So here's a question. How many of you have committed the same sin more than once? It's an impossible task. <clears throat> so what I do is I remind them, and you don't have to remember this, but I'll spell it out for you, but there's, there's two Latin terms. Uh, Two Latin terms are passe peccari, non passe peccari. If you want to write it down, uh, passe is P-O-S-S-E, peccari is P-E-C-A-R-R-E. -E. And it simply means this. Passe peccari in Latin simply means able to sin, which is uh, our state prior to and after the fall. Adam and Eve were able to sin, and they did sin, and we are able to sin. Non posse peccari simply means able not to sin. That's only going to come in our exalted state as we leave this earth and we are glorified in heaven. So an attempt to perfection or glorification, it it sets a Mormon up for failure. 
And that's what the Mormon church does. They, by telling them they have to be sinless, by telling them they have to try to achieve perfection, is setting them up to fail because it's an impossible task. They, they just can't do it, just like we can't do it. Show them James 2.10, where it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, what? He is guilty of all. So this is a really important verse to show them that, okay, you're trying to keep all these laws. You're trying to reach glorification. You're trying to reach perfection. And you're doing all these good works. But yet, James says... If you fail in one, you fail in all. So how does that make you feel? So they had the desire to reach perfection. They had the desire to achieve exaltation. And what they do, they're going to use Matthew 5, 8, where it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Um, in this verse point out that it's an exp <clears throat> that it's a future imperative meaning it's donating a command and also expressing an outcome or an end so, there's a parallel verse in the Old Testament Leviticus 19.2 where it says speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them ye shall be holy for I the Lord your God am holy so we're holy and we're perfect only by pursuing God's perfection, but we only reach that through faith in Jesus Christ and not by works. As a matter of fact, in, in Matthew 6, 1, Jesus admonishes, take heed that ye do not uh, your alms before men be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. So he's saying, don't show your works, don't show your prayers, don't show your alms. Because if you do, you've already received your reward. And the prophet Isaiah makes it pretty clear as far as our deeds, very familiar passage, uh, Isaiah 64, 6, and it says, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our inequities, like the wind, have taken us away. Remember, uh, Pastor Jeff brought this passage up a few weeks ago. <clears throat> so, the Mormons are going to strive to reach perfection. They're going to realize this impossible task. And then also show them Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Here's why I bring up the Roman, the Roman road. <clears throat> and I start with Romans 3.23, which most of the Roman road uh, that I've seen starts with that passage. And it simply says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does all mean? All, all means all. It means all of mankind. Sin is a lack of obedience, <clears throat> and all of us fall short of God's desire and perfection. And then I go to Romans 4, verses 4 and 5, and it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So, grace, as we know, means unmerited favor. And those who attempt works, their wages are not considered a gift, but considered what is due. Now, as the Apostle Paul puts it, if salvation was based on works, <clears throat> God would simply be giving the individual what is due. But God doesn't owe us anything. So it's not based on works, it's based on, on faith. 
the next I'm going to go to uh, Romans 5, 1 and 2, and it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So as believers, uh, we've already been justified. We've been deemed righteous by God. And as Christians, we need, need not... <clears throat> Uh, be concerned about divine judgment. Again, Christ paid the price. We don't have to do partly works <clears throat> and then ask God for grace beyond what's uh, in our own ability like the Mormons do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romans 5.8 But God commandeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God has already shown his love um, by providing Christ to die on the cross. We should have been the ones on the cross, not Christ. But yet God has already shown his love for us. We don't have to do works. We don't have to strive to be perfect because we're never going to reach that. But we just need faith in Christ. <clears throat> now, Romans 6.23, <clears throat> another verse, which I think is probably familiar with everybody. For the wages of sin is what? Is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, believing in the true Christ, we're guaranteed eternal life. But those who die in their sins who experience both physical and eternal separation from God. So, it says very clear that it is a gift from God, not something we have to earn. But we have to accept it. <clears throat> and one of the things that I, I often ask people is, <clears throat> when I explain to them it's a gift from God, I say, yes, it's a gift, but we still have to accept that gift. So for example, <clears throat> let's say you have an, a classic 1957 Chevy. And I'll say, Tim, it's yours. No strings attached. And Tim goes, I don't want it. You know, I, I want a 1966 Corvette. Did I offer Tim a gift? Yeah. But he had to accept it in order to receive the benefits of that gift. Well, that's no different than us having to accept the gift that, that God gives us through Christ. We still have to accept it. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> next I go to Romans 7, 18 and 20. It says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me, but how to perform with that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would not, do not, but the evil which I would not, I do. Now if I do that that I would not, it is no more that I do, but sin that dwelleth in me. Um, Paul speaks of in my flesh. So what he's referring to is man is ruled by our sin nature. And by being ruled by our sin nature, we are pursuing what? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And that's what Paul is talking about here. So then I go to Romans 8.1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What does it say? For there is now no condemnation. So this is our current position before God as a result of accepting the true Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we, we need to let the Mormons know that even though they admit that they believe in a Christ, a false Christ brings false salvation. 
It is only a true Christ that is going to bring true salvation. And this is what they, they need to understand because they think that because we talk about Jesus Christ, they talk about Jesus Christ, we talk about God the Father, they talk about God the Father, that if we're saved, they must be saved. <clears throat> but they don't understand that it has to be the true God, the true Christ, the true Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so then I go to Romans 10, 9 and 10. I say that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, to confess means an outward expression of our faith and acceptance again of who? The true Jesus Christ. Now in Romans 10, 13, which is the next one, uh, Paul writes, For soever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here, Paul is actually quoting an Old Testament uh, scripture, which is Joel 2, 32. And Joel says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So again, in Romans 10, 13, Paul is simply quoting Joel 2.32. <clears throat> then what I do is, for the last verse, I actually leave Romans. And then I go to the back of the New Testament, and I quote John, 1 John 1, 9. And it says this, If... We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, confessing, is confessing our sins a requirement for salvation? Sure. I mean, right here, John says, if we confess our sins. So, it's actually a requirement from salva <clears throat> for salvation. And in verse 6, John says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Well, that is, willfully chooses to sin. So, in Numbers 14, 18, it says, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving inequity and transgression. Okay, here it comes. But he will by no means clear the guilty. So it's only through Christ that we are deemed not guilty. And again, Jesus has already paid our debt. <clears throat> so that's the series of the Roman road to salvation that I use. And as you can see, there's a number of verses in there that talk about being saved by faith, not by worth. I mean, not by uh, works. So that's why I use, use those verses for Mormons. Now, how many of you ever, ever heard of Pascal's Wager? Blaise Pascal. <clears throat> so what, he, what Pascal said was, um, if you're not sure whether there's a God, and I'm paraphrasing him. If you're not sure there's a God, you can live this life <clears throat> and whether there is or not, if you believe you're no worse off than if you had not believed in God. But if God exists and you live this life as though he does not exist, then you pay the ultimate price. So, <clears throat> why am I bringing this up? Because philosophically, all religions could be false, correct? I'm talking philosophically. Now, obviously, I don't believe that, but it could be. 
And when we die, we just cease to exist. It's, it's like no more significant than blowing out a candle. Um, but all religions cannot all be true. Why? Because every religion claims to be the true religion, and they claim that all other religions are not true. <clears throat> so this also holds to, to Christianity and Mormonism. Now, Christianity and, Mormon, and Mormonism could, again, philosophically both be false, but they can't both be true because their doctrines contradict each other. <clears throat> so, but here's the thing. If Mormonism is true and Christianity is false, according to Mormon apostle uh, Dallin H. Oaks, he says, all will ultimately be resurrected, resurrected and go to a kingdom of glory. The righteous, regardless of current religious denomination, okay, regardless of what we believe or what our denomination is now, the righteous um, will ultimately go to a kingdom of glory more wonderful than any of us can comprehend. And then he says, even the wicked, or almost all of them, will ultimately go to a marvelous, though less uh, kingdom of glory. So he's saying pretty much everybody's going to be saved. It's matters of which of the three heavens you're going to go to. Now further, if <clears throat> you've heard me talk about uh, Apostle Bruce McConkie, if Bruce McConkie is correct in what he said, he says, honorable men of the earth who are blinded by the craftiness of men and who therefore do not accept the gospel law, meaning Mormon gospel law, will still attain the second, which is the terrestrial level of heaven. But here's where it gets interesting. In Doctrines and Covenants, McConkie says, these are those who receive the presence of the Son, but not the fullness of the Father. So think about this. If what they say is true, and if Christianity is true, Guess what? We spend eternity with Jesus. But if Christianity is false and Mormonism is true, we spend eternity with Jesus. I don't know about you, but from up here, I'm feeling pretty good about this. But if Christianity is true and Mormonism is false, then Mormons will spend eternity separated from God. So in John 14, 6, Jesus makes it clear to us, and Jesus says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And then lastly, maybe Mormons should look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 23, where it says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, Abstain from all appearances of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So, <clears throat> that's some of the ways that we can witness to Mormons. I know I threw a lot of stuff at you. Again, some of it was uh, new and some of it stuff you've heard before. And then again, next week, the last class, then I will get specifically into tactics. And again, what you can use for not just Mormons, but for anybody. And what it will do is it will teach you how to stay in control of the conversation. And that's what we want to do.